pull this up, but th thanks so much, Kim, for doing that. We're very pleased to have as our guest speaker today, poet Anne Chadwell Humphreys of Columbia. We learned about Anne through the South Carolina Humanity Speakers Bureau for a program she offers about Claire Barton and Harriet Tubman and the work they did in South Carolina around the same place and at the same time. She has joined us today in celebration of March as Red Cross Month to share part of the presentation with us, concentrating her thoughts today on Clara Barton, her work in South Carolina and the legacy she left behind. Anne is a published poet, recognized for her work through contests and honors, and the University of South Carolina is archiving her poetry papers. Her website is anne-chadwellhumphreys.com. A biography of Claire Barton attracted her attention and she carries a saying of Claire Barton in her purse. She says, Claire Barton remains an interesting, inspiring person to me, especially when I found her South Carolina connection. Today's program is sponsored by South Carolina Humanities, a not-for-profit organization, inspiring, engaging, and enriching South Carolinians with programs on literature, history, and heritage. Welcome, Anne. Thanks, Lisa. And thanks to all of you for chiming in. I'm going to, and of course, Kim, I'm going to put you in the feet of Claire Barton. Uh, I learned about her as we all did in school and they're the old black and white pictures of her. I'm telling you, she is a remarkable, she was a remarkable, remarkable woman. Some of you might've read biographies. The reason I became interested in her was kind of a backdoor message. A friend went to Washington DC and visited the Clara Barton Museum and I thought, with all the other museums, why would you do that? She brought this button back and offered it to me. And I carry it in my cosmetics purse. Can you see it? I may be compelled to face danger, but not fear it. To me, that really spoke to me. So I had my antenna up and the bicentennial of her birth was last Christmas. December 25th, 1821. And so there were more things about her on social media. And then I read a review, a really interesting review about a new biography about her, and specifically about the time in the Civil War. So um, I read it and then found all of this South Carolina connection. And you are doing much of the work maybe a different century than she did it, but wait till you he'll hear her story. Number one, did you know South Carolina I was, and Harriet Tubman were at Port Royal Sound. One was on St. Helena Island. One was on um, Hilton Head Island. CB was on Hilton Head Island. On the same day of the same year, that was um, in April, they have arrived April, 1863. They were sent down by the same governor in Massachusetts. And um, Harriet Tubman was assigned to more quote, I'm quoting the colored troops. There was the first free group of, again, quotes, colored group in the Navy, I mean, in the army. So she was tending there and Clara was more with the white side. They were also together at Battery Wagoner on Morris Island. They rode on Fa Edisto Island, um, Bali Island. And do you know where the Morris Island um, lighthouse is? It's kind of out in the water for those of you. You can see it from the battery but that is the battle of what's called Battery Wagoner. And it was one of the first fortifications of the Charleston Harbor to prevent Union soldiers from capturing Charleston. So there was a huge battle which I'll get into. Claire Barton also came to South Carolina after the 1886 Charleston earthquake. And she came again to the Sea Islands um, where she had been before in 1893 for a terrible hurricane. Now, I also found out um, that, because I was researching her, 
History Channel did a little YouTube clip on her and a man had found a letter from her. He was asking the History Channel to verify and it was a letter. May I have her signal? I have my friend Tootsie Klein off here handing me something. He happened to go to an estate sale and get in some books. Can you see that? Is that her signature? Can you see it? Kim? Yes, we can. Okay. All right, let's see you, thanks. <clears throat> in it is her response to someone who wrote from Massachusetts, I'm sorry, Burnt Cabin, PA, about the where, where was a missing soldier, a Mr. Israel Brown. And he was writing on behalf of the family and he had been missing. And I found out through this YouTube video that they traced him that he is buried in the Florence National Cemetery in Florence, South Carolina. For any of you all who are on the PD, I had planned to go on Thursday, but we were rained out. I have been in touch with the cemetery director, but I do want to go pay my respect. So what I'm going to do today, we just kind of have a conversation. And I'm going to tell you about Claire Barton's formative years, really before the Civil War. Uh, when she arrives in Washington, because they're very determinant of the person that she became. Then I'm going to tell you about her Civil War years. And then I'm gonna tell you about her years after when she went to Europe and met with the International Red Cross. And I'll tell you a little bit about how she got the United States. It took 10 years for the United States to accede to the treaty. So that's kind of my format. As we break into those pieces, we'll allow time for some chat questions, which Kim will read to us. And I hope I excite you about her as much as I am now. So Claire Barton was born in North Oxford, Mass, December 25th, 1821. She is the last, the fifth child by 11 years of her parents. She had uh, one sister, two sisters and two brothers, but she was 11 years different in age. Um, she hung out with her brothers a lot. They told her, taught her how to ride a horse, how to throw a rock, how to shoot a gun. And this is not like proper, pr proper behavior for a young woman. So her, at those times, so her mother invited a cousin over, this is not in this room, a cousin <laughs> over to teach her womanly ways because women were brought up to be um, nurturing and what was this? Nurturing and humble, humble as yes. the other and humble. And she wasn't really buying into that. And she's the youngest child. So at 11, her brother David fell off a ladder. This is all relevant to who she becomes. And she at 11 years old nursed him for two years to full recovery. When the doctors did not think he would ever walk again, she did. And she took care of animals. And throughout her life, she took care of people. They arrived at her house. In Washington, they arrived in the camps, uh, the Union camps, when she was in Andersonville prison after the war. People would come up to speak to her. Um, so she, she had bows throughout her life. Um, she was, one account said five feet tall and another said five feet five, but she's brown hair and the person wrote complimentary glossy brown hair and liquid eyes. But what really stood out about her is her fortitude, the way she walked, her bearing, her posture, her movement, her decisiveness, her quick action. Those are things that distinguish her <clears throat> even as a little girl. So as she grew, uh, grew up into a young woman, she wanted to get, she needed to get a job. So she took a teacher certificate at age 17. Here's a picture of her. 
and we'll show the I'll show you the birthplace too. This is see the curls in her hair. Mm -hmm. You can see it, okay, Kim? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, just let me know. Okay. All right. And here are pictures of her house, her home, her home. She grew up here. This is where she was born, and this is where she's buried. And if any of you go to Massachusetts, you might want to see it. Wait till you see her tombstone. What marks her grave? It's remarkable. All right. This was her house, and this is it now. Or is this is we... another picture of Clara Barton. Here's another picture of Clara Barton. She had pictures taken like by Matthew Brady, the famous Civil War photographer, but she said, I look terrible in those. I look gaunt and worn out and she ripped them up. But over time, she did get some pictures. Now what's this? This is Clara Barton as an older woman. Here she is as an older woman. She died April 12th, 1912. She worked up into her death. She did not falter. It's just so interesting, the energy she gets. In some ways she was ignored as a youngest child. She talked about being left out of discussions. She also became a rich letter riot writer and she educated herself. So she started, um, there were no women really in school teaching at that time. So, but somehow she, this is 1820s, 1840s, she was assigned to a school, a rough school, and these are one room schoolhouses who teach children from early age, even up into late teens. So there were some schools that were out of control. And she went in there and somehow gained the respect of the students. She became with the students, she became of the students and the other faculty and the parents. And so throughout her life, she had various posts in Massachusetts. Um, and throughout her life, people would come to her, um, you taught me. And what is important about this, she taught some of the men who joined the Union Army and she would see them on the battlefield and it would move her. So it, she did that several years and then she kind of got tired of that and wanted to educate herself some more. I got this out of order a little bit. So she enrolled in a three-year school specialty for teaching. And while she was there, she was 10 years older than anyone else who was there, but she made some lifetime friends and some with the faculty. After she finished that, one of her friends was from Bridgetown, New Jersey. I think maybe a friend had a friend in Bridgetown, New Jersey. Her reputation had followed her to be an excellent school administrator, teacher, loved by the students, and they accomplished a lot. So she went to Bordertown, um, New Jersey. And it's just at that time that states are starting to legislate public schools. So she, she went down there and began, um, took up where another schoolmaster left off, but she knew the legislation. And so she campaigned to the parents and to the county school board and the different representatives and senators. She was not afraid of going to people in high places. She got approval for a public school because she had grown the school from two boys to eight children to 20, and it was exponential. So during that time of growth, she was able to get funding for the first public school building in the country. That's what I read. I'm not a scholar, I'm an interested person. So that, that town, because of her success, built two school buildings and built the student population to 650. When it was up at 650 and she was doing a new job, a great job and she had hired the faculty, the school board thought she, it was too big for a woman to run. So they demoted her and hired another man to do that. And she had been paid, she had demanded equal pay for equal work in the Massachusetts. So she, and another teacher decided to leave and they picked Washington quote city, now DC, 
because the Library of Congress was there and she wanted to do some more research. And she, so they got there and they roomed in a boarding house, which is on 7th Street Northwest. It's still standing. And her representative from her district in Massachusetts came to call on her and see how he could help her. And he introduced her to the uh, leader of the Patent and Copyright Office of the federal government. And so that person, a Mr. Mason, was impressed with her conversational skills, with her um, literacy, her brain, uh, and her ability, and hired her. And she was one of four, only four women in the federal government at that time. And that was in the 1850s, mid 1850s. Um, so she worked in the patent office, which she really liked. She was the only woman in there and she had a good job. Um, and she liked the work because it was with patents and copyrights and all these new discoveries. But the administration changed, must have been um, a presidential election. And the man who was in charge lost his job and she lost her job. So she somehow scrambled around to get some money. She was a saver. And I think she did inherit a little bit from a parent. Um, but then uh, Lincoln was elected. And then the war, oh, during that time, by the way, she would pick up, people would come to her door and she would bandage them. She would give them food. She would give them a place to stay. There was a, she even gave her bed to another older woman. And, and so this is, she tracks because she knows how to do this. She's not trained. There are no nursing schools at this time, but she's a good reader so she could read the medical books. And then the war broke out in Fort Sumter, April 12th. 1861, and Lincoln called for troops to come to Washington City to guard it against the rebels who were in Confederates, I'm a Southerner, um, in Virginia. They were just right across the Potom Potomac River. So he was calling these troops to come and, and guard. And there were not even tent hospitals set up there were no provisions. The, the generals at the time thought hospitals were too expensive. So it is not prepared. And it's a week after the war is declared. So her boys, it's boys at this time, from Massachusetts, from her hometown, it's the 5th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, volunteered and they left Boston to a parade and they went through New York with a parade and they were marching and they hit Baltimore, which was a Maryland, which was a Confederate ally. And they were attacked by the Confederate allies and wounded and some killed and all their luggage was askew. So these wounded soldiers arrived in Washington city on a train with with no water, no food, and only the clothing on their back. So Sarah, um, Clara and her sister, Sarah, went down to meet the train. They knew it was coming. They had heard the news. They went to meet the train and she saw people she knew, men she knew, and there were no bandages. So she was beginning to gather up supplies, get them off the train, staunch the bleeding, somehow get them some water and some food. And she put them, there were no, there was no hospital. Well, there was one hospital, it was so small. And she put up the soldiers in people's homes. And she even took them into the Capitol building. This is before the dome was completed. Do you have a picture of the dome? Oh, we got, we do have one? Yeah, I, I got one. I have the soldiers being cared right. for. It'll, it'll be I, do, I do have it, yes. We found this new picture. Uh, this is like it. Anyway, they lay on the hall in the halls of Congress. 
this is what the Capitol looked like at that time. And the story is that Lincoln wanted it to continue to be finished as evidence of the unity of the country. So, um, so she's tending, she's scrambling for supplies. She's alerting her friends up in her hometown. Please, please get some clothing, some blankets, some bandages, preserves. And she spread the word. And so women's group in that era started sending her supplies. Now her boarding house was between the White House and the Capitol. And at, there was a farmer's market at that time. So people would give donations. And again, she did not have an income except maybe what she inherited. She would shop at the farmer's market um, there and then take provisions to the soldiers to get them well. Well, after she had experienced this and there were more battles, she wanted to be at the battlefront because she wanted it to be between the bullet and the hospital. And Lincoln gave her a pass. She, Clara worked through the Let's Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of War. Her no. senators were great allies to her. Harold Wilson and Charles Sumner were her senators and her representatives. So they approached Lincoln and there is a letter with I give Clara Barton right to pass to the battlefield signed A. Lincoln, as we all know his signature. So she joined the troops with her uh, supplies and she would gather wagons on her own. Eventually she was later in the war, she was assigned a team, Teamsters team with three men driving three wagons with mules. But Clara went by herself the first few times and she fought and she was at Bull Run and Cedar Mountain and Fredericksburg. And during these times, those soldiers would be on the field on hay that exposed to the sun, exposed to the elements. And there were 3,000 there at the Cul Culpeper. I believe it's that battle, the first battle she went to. There were 3,000 soldiers groaning in the field. So she saw her job, there was no food, no water. So she set up a kitchen and she figured out a way to get water and she would go out to those soldiers and nurse them, comfort them, bandage them, give them a cup of rum punch. She, she carried brandy and rum because that was an anesthetic at that time as well. Bandages until the ambulances could take them back to the field hospital behind the battle lines. The ox carts were, the ambulances were ox carts drawn by one man and no springs. So the wounded would be put in there and bounced to the field hospital where they would get more careful care. Here's a picture, Ann, that okay. is Clara Barton two wounded federal soldiers being cared for okay. by a nurse. This is just an example. This is not Claire Barton, but this is an example. There are just two in here, but there would be dozens and dozens of people and even hundreds in some places. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, she did not like, now some of the, she began to develop a reputation for being, um, excellent at her work for being a logician, a logician, a decision maker. And she made friends with many surgeons. And of course the soldiers knew her, but there were also generals who did not like that a woman, she was the only woman on the battlefield, did not like that she was there. So I skipped ahead a little bit. And you're on oh. track, you're okay. Um, she had to wring out her skirts yeah. with the blood. So, let me stop here. Help me remember that. Are there any questions in the chat room, Kim? No, ma'am. No questions at this okay, time. Okay, good. <laughs> we'll keep going. All right. So now we're into the Civil War. She would, um, there would be artillery around her. 
the, the surgeons were up at the front. And as you know, those images of piled limbs and they're just working away, working away and they run out of provisions. There was a one story where she joined a surgeon whom she knew from other battles. And there's all kinds of artillery going around her. I believe this was Fredericksburg. And all of his other helpers had dispersed. They were too afraid to be in the line of fire, but he was there. And she said, how can I help? And he said, do you think you can take it? And she says back, if you can take it, I can take it. And she would take her skirt and pull it up around her waist, um, which would show her ankles. <laughs> but she was right there comforting them. She would make notes about who they were, where they were from, because they're begging her to contact their family. They didn't want to be forgotten. And that book is on display at, I think, the medicine, Civil War Medicine Museum. All right. So at that time, they sent word back that um, Fredericksburg was, had civilians in their homes and they were closed as these soldiers were all exposed to the elements and word went back to the front that those citizens need to open their homes to these wounded soldiers, all wounded soldiers. And so there were, there were stories about the men lying on bookshelves in the lot, maybe they had a library and on tables and under tables and in corners and chairs. And some of them were not recognizable and some were young and she would, I think she said there were 1200 people in this one house. And then somebody else said she had tendency to exaggerate, but she, she said she pulled up her skirt and wrung her skirt out of blood out of her skirt. She was the ankle deep in blood. Um, <clears throat> Our next section is Clara Barton in South Carolina. All right. So now we're gonna to go to Claire Barton in South Carolina. Now I will say she worked herself almost to death. So after some of these battles, she would go back to her boarding house where her friend lived and her sister happened to move to Washington and they would care for her. She, she was exhausted and it took months to recover for her. She also had clothing that was that was rags because she didn't really care about clothing. She was just out in the battlefield. But when you're in Washington city and if you need to call on Congress, you need to be dressed appropriately. So she sent word up to her friends in Oxford, Massachusetts who made her some dresses um, for the battlefield. She commissioned some battlefield dresses but also some proper dresses for street wear and um, receptions because that was much part of her job. All right, so 1863, she's been in several battles, but she's also hit a roadblock and battles were not consistent, <clears throat> excuse me, meaning there were battles and then they would stop and then be another battle over there. So it wasn't constant work. So she was in between a battle. Mm looking for something to do. By the way, at this time, she had an income because it was wartime, she was allowed to hire a substitute for her position in the patent office. And she paid him half her wages. So she had half wages. She never got a stipend from the Department of Defense. She never got benefits, a pension. She was not employed by the army. She worked for free and worked through creating this volunteer network. Volunteer, that's what you all are, volunteer network, people helping. Um, but she was organized. Sometimes volunteers would just show up on the battlefield and they were not, they were not trained, they weren't the right personalities. And so part of her job was to kind of vet some of the volunteers. I did say that the ambulances were ox carts. She was part of designing the new ambulances and even creating an ambulance 
core. There wasn't even an ambulance core for the battlefield. So she got that going. So she's a little restless and um, went to her governor, Andrews in Massachusetts and said, I, I want to get on the battlefield, I want to get. And he said, why don't you go down to the Union Army of the South in Port Royal, Sound, South Carolina. And so she took a boat down there and coincidentally, Harriet Tubman ended up in his office. And he also told her the same person told her to go down South. Um, she wouldn't go except to rescue people, but he said they're the new quote, colored troops organizing. And also this is 1863. So the Emancipation mm -hmm. Proclamation was January 1st, 1863. So black men could enroll in the army. They could enlist, enlist. And if any of you are old enough to remember the movie Glory, it came out in 1989. Uh, it's an incredible story. Uh, Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman and Matthew Broderick, and it won awards. It, it is to me a movie for your life. So it talks about the Massachusetts 54th Regiment, Infantry Regiment of Black men who assembled in um, Massachusetts. Two of the sons were of Frederick Douglass. And so they were shipped down to Beaufort to help with uh, possibly taking Charleston. The Confederates had left a lot of their plantations, left that area. So the Union fortification there was keeping the people, enslaved people working, giving them some pay. I mean, it was meager, um, starting some schools. There were women missionary women who were sent down, same to Penn Center. Um, it, you can research that. Maybe you all from the Low Country would know about this in Beaufort. So Harriet Tubman was really working with those troops and Clara was with the other troops. Now, on June 2nd, 1863, and Clara, Clara Barton was riding. She knew how to ride the ho horses and she would ride horses on the beach for, but she was restless, restless. She needed a battle. But in the meantime, Harriet Tubman had been commissioned to lead three ships up the Combahee River to rescue 700 enslaved people. And I read two different, that was, she had sent out reconnaissance people. She had some money was given some money to pay people to be spies, to alert the enslaved people. Do you have that picture? Um, Harriet Tubman first. Would okay, like least, I, just, Tubman? I just want you to know that Harriet Tubman was a contemporary of Clara in the Barton. So here's Harriet Tubman. By the way, March 10th was Harriet Tubman's, Harriet Tubman Day. And I am fascinated with her too. Here's right. another picture of Harriet Tubman in a different attire. Is she in with the rifle here? No, she doesn't okay. have the rifle. No, we just showed the rifle. Okay. All right. So at a, here's the battle. Here's the, the battle from Harper's Weekly. From Harper's Weekly. So Harriet Tubman and her team rescued and people were swimming in the water trying to get on the boats, tipping over the rowboats. And in the meantime, some of the overseers were shooting at them. So Clara, this was going on June 2nd. And the next night, Clara Barton was having dinner with some of the generals, quartermaster, and they talked about that raid. But I don't have a record of the two of them meeting, but I'd like to think about it. However, um, the general said, we're going to try and take Charleston. So, um, so the troops in the Union South Army of the South were getting ready. Harriet Tubman was getting them ready. Claire Barton was doing her thing, getting supplies, um, getting ready. And they sailed up the coast 
there, there happen to be two Bibles, but I'm going to tell you about the second one. Would you like to show the map? I have two okay. maps. <clears throat> What's this map? The naval, the naval attack at Hilton Head, November 7, 1861. Okay, this is the battle where the Union soldiers um, captured the Port Royal Sound. And on it, does it have islands on it? Yes, it does. And this one yeah. also has islands. Yeah, islands, yes, so you can kind of see. So that's in Charleston but, Harbor defenses and Fort Wagner. All right, now, <laughs> this is the battle we're going to talk about here in a minute. Battery Wagner, you might have heard of it as Castle Pinckney. Um, raise your hand, just raise your real hand in front of your face if you've heard about, about that. If you've been to Folly Beach, raise your hand. If you've been to Morris Island, raise your hand. Um, if you've driven by, if you've been to Edisto, raise your hand. They would put troops ashore on Edisto some back troops and then they would put the fighting troops on Folly Beach. And Battery Wagoner was one of the really well fortified um, garrisons, um, forts. But the general thought with all of these soldiers and the black troops joining and the other soldiers that they could beat that uh, fort down and get the rebels to surrender. Here's your, here's your picture. The American flag and the Confederate flag. This is where the Confederates were. This, and it is an histor <clears throat> a historical place that you can go to and read about. Okay. Now Charleston is fortified very well by a number of uh, forces of over on Sullivan's Island, um, the, of course, Fort Sumter. No, it wasn't Fort Sumter because that was taken over the Confederates. But there are a variety of um, forts around the area protecting it. But the Union soldiers sent ships up there. And what is different about this is this is the first time black, a black troop Led, led the charge. And what was hard about it is they could creep up in the marsh, but there was a, a stretch of sand, maybe 200, you know, in the marshes, you have land and then you have water and land. There was an exposed, they had to run up the exposed sand to get to Battery Wagner to ascend. And as a result of that, um, half of that group of men, 650, 300, the casualties were like 50%. And in the movie, they are buried right there at the base of Fort Wagner in a mass grave. And that would be underground now with their um, Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, who was buried with them. And his family said that's where he would want to be. So while the, and it was a bloody, brutal battle. And so Harriet Tubman's over on one side. I have documents of her being there and Claire Barton was at another place using field glasses. They were watching. At one point, one of her friends was shot and she ran out on the battlefield to capture him with bullets flying all around, flying all around her. And, he did a crab walk back and he did survive. But the fact that they're two, and this is bloody. This is where faces are blown off and abdomens are eviscerated and these poor soldiers. So she would get them off the battlefield to the field hospitals. And again, she knew some of the soldiers. She knew many soldiers and these good men were from Massachusetts so she could talk with them about Massachusetts. And um, anyway, let's see what else I wanna say. That battle ended, the Union finally captured Battery Wagoner, but it took two bloody months and it was really well fortified. 
Okay. Missing Soldiers Bureau is next. Right. <clears throat> Any questions to this point? No? Okay. I know some people. All right. After the war, um, she was sent up to Annapolis and Claire Barton was to receive letters. So all these letters are pouring in from mothers, brothers, children. Where's my father? Where's my brother? Sorry, sisters. They're all wanting to know where the men folk are. And there was a hastily set up missing soldiers bureau up in Annapolis, but all the soldiers were coming back through there and they were emaciated. You couldn't recognize them and they were so busy. The generals all were trying to process all of these soldiers that Clara was overlooked. So she um, requests that she do this business from her boarding house on Northwest 7th Street. So this time, post-Civil War, she was awarded $15,000 to begin to tend to the 63,400 letters. Now, there was telegraph them, but this is letter writing we're talking about. And when she was in Annapolis and always on the battlefield, she had that notebook and she would keep records. She would not be able to recognize them but she would ask the soldiers, have you heard of this person? Did you fight with this person? Do you know what happened to this person? And that is the way she began to patch together a list, which she um, published. So she hired two people, one of whom was a prisoner at Andersonville Prison in Georgia. It was an infamous prison and side note, when Sherman was kept going through Atlanta and starting his march to the sea, that prison in Andersonville had 13,000 people just, and it was, it's not been there. It's not, it's not that big. And there were, this one young man who was a prisoner was in charge of recording the deaths and the locations of their graves. So he also made a copy for himself because it was too valuable to let get lost. So Clara hired him and he had his, his list. There's more story to that, but that's just general. Um, again, a note, as Sherman was coming through Georgia, they, the Confederates were dispersing prisoners from Andersonville to other quickly created prisoners of war camps, one of which was in Florence, South Carolina, the stockade, which is now the cemetery. And hundreds would die a day. There are 12 trenches of bodies buried in that place. And then there, there are more, it's still an open cemetery. And there remains of the prisoner of war camp behind that cemetery. But they were trying to keep the Union Army from getting those soldiers because they wanted them for exchange. And also for those of you in Columbia, behind the Riverbank Zoo was a POW camp created just like this for union officers. And it was right above the zoo, above the Saluda River Rapids. There's a neighborhood there now. It was called Camp Sorghum. And these camps were, had, they were fenced. They had a stream in it. They had no covering. The, peop the people had to chop down trees, branches, dig holes for their protection. There was a uh, a squad that was allowed to go down to the Saluda River and bring up water. Um, there's stories of them having one fork to share among so many people and maybe one bowl. And they named it sorghum because they, that's, they had sorghum and cornmeal. That's all they could serve them. And we have a picture of the Florence Federal Cemetery. Here's Florence Federal Cemetery. Now, yeah. as it is today. As it is today. Now, I bring this up because I think I mentioned if Claire Barton mm -hmm. found one of the soldiers who was buried there for the family. 
And as I said, I want to go pay my respects to a Mr. Israel Brown. That's another South Carolina connection. Mm -hmm. That work went on to 1868. And she found 22,000 missing soldiers. There is one report of one who wanted to be missing. <laughs> he wanted to be missing and she chastised him for that. But finding where people were buried and getting them into a proper burial. It, it's an amazing, amazing story. Um, all right, from there, she finished that job in 1868. So that was three years working with that. And then she went to Europe. Yeah, well, she went on the lecture circuit. Yes. After that, she needed an income. And so she went on the lecture circuit. She was so well-spoken. <laughs> And her stories were captivating. She went all around the country like Mark Twain, like Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass. They were all going around the country giving stories. And Claire Barton was paid the same amount of money as the men speakers, which was $75 to $100 per speech. She insisted on that. And she made quite a bit of money on that tour, which she stockpiled, she banked, but she she went all over the country giving these. And every time she would go, she would, and she was a small woman, you know, it's either she's five five or five feet. She always looked half her age, always trim. Um, a voice, the way she walked, people talked about the way she walked on the stage, the way she held herself and told the stories. So she would tell battlefield stories and people would raise their hand. I was there, I was there. And a surgeon ran up to the front and said, yes, I was with you at this battle. And the soldiers, if she were speaking in Massachusetts, you know, there would be some of her students. Some of her students would show up at her boarding house. Uh, do we have pictures of the boarding house now? Or is that later? I'd, no, that's later. Okay, <laughs> all right. So she made quite a bit of money. Then she exhausted herself again. And she went to bed. She could not, she, she could hardly eat. She could hardly walk. And she was nursed by her sister and her other friend back to health. And one doctor, so now we're into 1870, 71. One doctor told her, you have to get away from the battlefield. I'm sending you to Europe. Now, I guess she had enough money to pay for that. I don't know the funding, but she and her sister went uh, to England at first, did two weeks there and to relax and try and shed some of, come to terms with some of what she had seen. And the sister went back and then Clara, who knew people in high places in Washington, diplomats. So she went to stay with someone she knew in Geneva an American couple, there were several Americans over there. And when she was there visiting, a delegation of the American, of the International Red Cross came to call on her to say, why hasn't the United States joined us in this? And she said, I've never heard of this before. So um, that was her introduction. It turned out she began to work with the International Red Cross and that part about not getting in battle, she ignored that. She was back in battle uh, for the Franco-Prussian War. What stood out to her so much in Europe was the devastation on the civilian um, population. Um, she also said women were beaten regularly. They were hired to carts, like harnessed, like animals. and beasts of burden and then all the different civilians had their homes and had no way to make a money money so she fought she did that in the franco prussian war when that finished she set up a sewing uh, like manufacturing for the women to make clothing they didn't even have their own clothes somehow she got some money and they began their own jobs and they could sew clothes. And then they would get to middle-class status 
And then she would expand that to other places where there were war. She knew how to organize this. She knew how to get equipment and supplies. So then she comes back to the United States again. She's exhausted. What time is it? Uh, we have we have eight minutes, seven minutes. Okay. She was exhausted and went back but to Washington, but it took her 10 years. She campaigned on Capitol Hill to get the United States to finally sign on to the International Red Cross, which she headed until she was age 60. So that was in 1881. She was born in 1821. That's 60 years old. She's still working on the front. And then she went to fight in the Spanish-American War. There are pictures of her in Havana, Cuba. She went to the Turkish uh, Prussian War. She was over there. She was the only woman allowed on the battlefield mm -hmm. there. Then she came back and um, then the American Red Cross added an amendment about the disasters, including the disasters to make um, the Red Cross neutral to treat all sides and civilians, but also to operate in peacetime as well as wartime, which you do now for house fires, for floods, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes. The Red Cross is there now all over the world. The Red Cross began to grow and it began to outgrow what Claire Barton could do. So I think it was 1881, oh no, what's 20 years? She was 80 when she was, says 1901? 1902, August 1902, six. here she is. This is about her in Russia okay. with the czar. When she was over in Europe, she was so lauded by, here she is with the czar of Russia, before oh, World War. No, this is the other picture. Okay. I'll have that one back and you may have that one. Nope. Let's turn it over. This way. There's two handsome men. We want to see them. There. Okay. There. <clears throat> she was befriended by European royalty, by empresses, by czars, generals. She won the Iron Cross in France, Germany. She had these big <clears throat> medals like a general, 20 of them, when she came back to the United States, which she was becoming a worldwide known name. After the Civil War, people knew her for Missing Soldiers Bureau and her speeches. So she goes to Europe, she's recognized by those people. And that's how she could leverage influence to get the treaty filed. Okay, what are the pictures do we have? I think you wanted me to read the article from the newspaper article about her going to the Quintennial Conference of the International Red Cross she's Association. To to her? No, it's okay. Okay, and she's was, gonna read off camera. And was full of, in, of enthusiasm about it. 50 nations were represented, said Miss Barton. By the hundred delegates to the conference, I was treated with such great kindness that I can hardly find words to express my appreciation. The czar personally decorated me with the highest order with which he can honor anyone not of royal blood, a decoration which he has bestowed upon many of the crowned heads of Europe. I was entertained in the palace of Russia and the Imperial railway trains were placed at my disposal. B.F. Tillinghart, another Red Cross delegate spoke up. When Miss Barton was presented to the czar, he said, she bent to kiss the monarch's hand, as is the custom, but the great white czar drew back and said, no, not you, Miss Barton, and shook her hand instead. Her whole tour through Russia was a triumphal journey for this world popular woman. I was very much impressed, said Miss Barton, with the czar's earnestness for declaring universal peace and to assuage the horrors of war. Standing on the pier, this aged woman, hale and hearty, despite her long years of beneficent service, looked as hale and hearty as a woman half her age. She was the entire, she was the center of a throng of steamer friends eager to speak to her once more before leaving. 
she's 80. This is 1901 and 1902. She's 80 years old. There, do we have a picture of her with a dress? Or maybe I didn't see that picture. Anyway, we have, we have one of her uh, founding the Red Cross with all the yes. nurses and the, and she's in the dark dress in the okay. middle. All right, just one second. I, I, had an, I have an assistant who we were looking through photos, so I've gotten what we've done, but um, so she's an international person, but she had outgrown. And so the Red Cross pushed her out, but she founded the First Aid Society, which created first aid kits until her death, April 12th, 1912, she turned 90, December 25th, that uh, Christmas. All right, what else do I have? We have her um, tombstone right. marker. This is her tombstone, which is where she's buried. Look how big this is. And it has inscriptions of all the battles and wars in which she fought. It's, it's just amazing. We have quotes um, we should have a from her of the Northwest, her, her boarding house. Where's that boarding That's house? back here. We, we sort of went through that one. I'll I do want to tell you, her boarding house, Kim, how is our time? Um, we are at 1259. We're at 1259. 12, when are we? We have one minute till one o'clock. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> All right. We're I'm so, so sorry. Much fun. We're having so much fun. If you have chat questions, please send them to Kim. I'm so sorry. I got excited, but it is so interesting. Thank you, Kim, for having me. Thank you, volunteers, for coming. I applaud your work um, and best wishes for March being Red Cross Month. And Anne, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your knowledge and passion about Clara Barton and her work in South Carolina. This has been a great presentation, and we're so appreciative of this opportunity to come together to celebrate Red Cross Month by learning more about our founder and her legacy in our state. We also want to share our appreciation to South Carolina Humanities for sponsoring this program through their Speakers Bureau, Humanities Out Loud. And we want to thank all of you for joining us today and for what you do in support of the Red Cross mission every day. As we continue to to celebrate Red Cross Month, please remember that there's no better way to recognize the legacy of Claire Barton in South Carolina than to recognize the work that our South Carolina volunteers continue day in and day out to support the organization and to further the mission. So thank you all so much for what you do every day. And Anne, thank you to you and your assistant for the day. And we hope you all have a great day. Just listening to oh, and Anne, you're getting lots of thank yous in the chat, but no questions. So I think um, everybody is thanking you for their for your time and for your amazing presentation and for your inspirational presentation and your information and your time. So you're getting lots of thank yous in the chat. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm list. I can hear, hear some of them. I'm glad and the South Carolina Humanities will hear this too. And Is everybody gone? Well, we still have some people that are hanging in here but we're officially um, mm -hmm. calling our presentation to a close and thanking everybody for attending. And certainly our chat is still open. So if anybody wants to still drop something in the chat, you're welcome to do that. Yeah. And Anne, thank you so much for, for helping us out with this presentation today. We appreciate yeah. your time. It was fun, wasn't it? It was good to... Maybe if they put something in the chat. You know, I I didn't know, I didn't know about this either. You know, and if I were them, I'm not sure I would know questions to ask. <laughs> Wouldn't uh, would you? Have, oh, me? Is this kind of an pardon? I wouldn't know what questions to ask. There's so much information, and it's also interesting to listen to. 
Um, so this was great. I really appreciate it. Um, so much too. history, so much detail in the history that a, a casual, um, yeah. ca someone of casual interest wouldn't have had the opportunity to pick up on. I'm not going to dress up like her. I'm taller than she is. <laughs> <laughs> But I know there's some, you know, people who do the dramatic things. <laughs> I'm just happy to share this in the picture. Okay, well, I'll sign oh, off. I'll fill out my good. evaluation and Thank to be you. continued. I hope yes, I can help you another way. But. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to work with you on this and to get to hear your presentation today. And um, I'll follow up with you about anything else from South Carolina Humanities, but we sure appreciate your time. Okay, you and so you'll send me a link to the program. Yes, okay. ma'am, I will. Okay. okay. All right, bye. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Bye.